Hello everyone, welcome back to Case Studies with the BizDoc. This week I'm gonna take a look at strategy and this is a request that many people had. They wanted to know what exactly happened to Apple during those 12 years. We've read this book or read that book, but what do you think was the essence of what happened between the point that Steve Jobs left and the point that he got back? And I call it 12 years of searching for the right strategy. And I'm gonna take a look at Blue Ocean Strategy and a few other things this week as we look into strategy through the lens of 12 years of Apple. There's two things that I hope you take away this week. And the first thing is, it's never too late to get strategy right. It was 12 years of wandering when Steve Jobs refocused the company. Well, he restructured, then he refocused, then he introduced new products, all within a very, very laser focus for strategy that he had. And before that, there was just this wandering in the wilderness, which may offend some people who saw Apple during that time, but I think you're gonna see what I mean. So there's point one. It says it's never too late to get strategy right. And point two is as we've learned from Steve Jobs and others, product visionaries are rare. And at times, we need to find ways that we can manage them better. They may not conform to pure corporate culture, but if you find the way that you can get your horse whisperer, as they used to say, get the whisperer that can work with gifted product strategists that know what they're doing, then you strike gold in a corporate environment that may be hard to do. So let's take a look at Apple. First of all, for those of you who maybe weren't even born when it happened, way, way back in 1983, Steve Jobs goes and recruits John Scully, who at the time was the CMO of Pepsi. And if you've read the books, there's the familiar thing where Steve Jobs says to John Scully, do you want to just sell sugared water or do you want to change the world? Now I'm paraphrasing the quote, but it was a very bold statement that he made to Scully and Scully says, okay, I'm in. Well, within two years, in the middle of 85, Steve Jobs was pushing the Macintosh division this way. The Apple II division was kind of going this way. John Scully had, you know, thoughts he had. And the board says, man, you got to get control of Steve Jobs because he's innovating. He's trying to do new products, blah, 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 blah. We've all read the book. John Scully says to Steve Jobs, you're done. We stripped you of duties and everything. And he, Jobs says, well, if, I'm, if that's it, then I quit. And that was... June of 85. John Scully, now the market had been sensing what was going on and they thought, fantastic, this guy that made Pepsi-Cola do this in marketing and everything, he's gonna run. He's gonna get it going. Well, you know, he is credited with coining the term personal digital assistant. Uh, some people credit him with that. And he was championing a thing called the Newton. Interesting enough, the Newton replaced a larger tablet that had a stylus that looks a lot like my you know, iPad today. And nonetheless, that, was, that lost and here came Newton. So at first, the market reacted pretty well uh, to Steve Jobs being gone and was looking forward to Apple charging forward. And it went up to a peak of 80 within uh, two years of Steve Jobs leaving. And so that would be the highlight of the next 12 years. So the highlight is achieved on the stock market two years after Steve Jobs leaves. From there, you can go back and take a look at what happened. I believe that this was a textbook exercise in Red Ocean. And after eight long years, the board fires Scully then they bring in Michael Spindler, who was the president of National Semiconductor, a chip company. He wasn't, a, that's not a consumer facing front end guy to be thinking about innovative products. Well, nonetheless, he didn't last long. Had three years and in losses, including one noteworthy situation where I think the sales were about six billion for the year. And he went to the board and told them that they had over a billion dollars in unsold inventory that had to be written off. Wait, six billion in sales and one billion dollars of unsold inventory? And you're coming in to tell the board about that? If I was the board, you know what I would have said? Damn, you're fired. You know, I would have said both. I don't would have said it again, damn, and be gone today. You know, that's what it would have been. Nonetheless, you have this guy from National Semiconductor, 
if you go back and look at the history of Apple, find in any of the interesting, relevant, forward-thinking strategy on product and distribution. As a matter of fact, they jumped into what's called a red ocean. Now, what's a red ocean? A red ocean would be like me deciding that I'm going to sell a caramel sugar mystery flavored soda that competes with Coke and Pepsi. We'd be like, Tom, you're nuts. You know, Coke and Pepsi are beating each other's brains out. And have you noticed that Coke and Pepsi, the core products, are on the decline? Diet beverages are here. You know, that, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of sugar cubes in that Coke. What the hell are you doing, Tom? Well, that would be me making a foolish decision to try to jump into a red ocean. And boy, I like to know where I'm going to find the money to do that because anybody with sense wouldn't fund that company. Nonetheless, a red ocean is where you have all this competition on top of each other. Apple actually tried to make Mac clones and um, you know, compete head to head with the PC by making this thing called the PowerPC version of the Mac that could run software like the IBM PC, which was the original, and then all the clones and everything that came after it, and the dawn of Compaq and Dell and a lot and Gateway and a lot of other noteworthy uh, brands, some of which are around, some of which are not around anymore. But nonetheless, you're jumping in and you're competing with everybody basically on their terms. So. What do they do? Well, Spindler gets fired and they hire Gil Emilio. Well, Gil Emilio had been on the board of Apple. He'd seen some of the carnage and he looked around a little bit and he was looking for ways to innovate. And to his credit, you know, about a year after he got there and uh, Gil Emilio there was there for like 500 days. And he wrote a book called Fi His 500 Days of Apple. Interesting read, help you out a little bit, but you know, just skim it. Don't go buy it. Just skim a copy if you can get your hands on it. And he bought Next Computer because what was Steve Jobs during all this time? Well, Steve founded a company called Next Computer and he was, you know, learning a lot and he got his own mentorship. I think we know that by now, but we want to focus on the strategy here. So they bring that in and believe it or not, this acquisition, which I think was like $429 million, I think. So it wasn't like a big billion dollar acquisition. It was done in the spring, excuse me, right before spring, February, and then Steve Jobs will come back right there in September of 1997. And, you know, it's interesting to point out that when he came back, the stock was right around 17 to 20. You can go look up the historical stock uh, ticker uh, close rates, <clears throat> close prices, excuse me. And within um, two years to the day that he was back, it was at 60. So he had basically tripled the price of the stock. And by the end of that year, the end of 1999, the stock was at 100. And then shortly thereafter, it did a stock split two for one. So being at 100 within two years of jobs being back would, would be higher than where it was two years after Scully joined. So you can kind of see once jobs focused where things went. Well, I love talking about blue ocean strategy, so let's talk about blue ocean strategy now that you have the backdrop. Apple meandered. Apple wasn't being unique, and that was what it was all about. Um, and Apple was trying to sell against everybody, and they actually thought their competitor was market share of the IBM PC. Well, interestingly enough, they did get market share for Macs in this area up to about 10%. And shortly after Jobs got back, he canceled the clone program in the name of, of Mac strategy, and the Mac market share went down to 3%. But there was greater things that he was thinking about, and we're gonna dive into that a little bit. If you're ever really thinking about starting your own company, and I know many of you entrepreneurs are, you gotta read Blows and Strategy, because right at the beginning of the book is basically what they call the four actions framework. And the four action framework, right there, page 29 of the hardcover book, it talks about the path to innovation in a blue ocean where there are no sharks chomping each other, competitors just eating at each other for the last nickel of profit. And by the way, in red oceans, they're usually red oceans because everybody's getting cut wide open by discounting, promotions, price competition. There's nothing unique and you're just in a sea of blood as the sharks are actually attacking each other. Whereas a blue ocean is you have found a new place, a new value, a new uh, 
opportunity to drive. And they talk about, in these four action frameworks, basically the following. What can you reduce below the industry standard that would represent improvement? What can you raise above the industry standard that would bring improvement? What can you just freaking eliminate that is not necessary that people don't appreciate or don't need or don't want or drives them nuts? And what could you create that's brand new that brings it to it? And those four action frameworks that Kim and Marborn, who wrote Blue Ocean Strategy, put together, they hit the nail on the head. Now, this book wouldn't be published until, until the mid-2000s. I think it was 2005, something like that. So it wouldn't be published, but Steve Jobs was acting very much in the, in the, the vein of the Blue Ocean. Now, let's take a look at it. He indicated that the way you buy computers was flawed. There needed to be a different relationship between Apple and the customer when the computer was bought. And um, he felt that the way that the Mac was represented in retail was wrong, that we need to reduce the poor presentation of computers almost presented like at a bazaar. We need to reduce that and we need to raise the standard of interaction with the customer at the point of sale. And we just need to eliminate being a Me Too clone with no differentiation to it. And we need to create, therefore, a new buying experience and a new product experience. And you remember the colored Macs? He came out the iMacs and they were all colored and they were powerful, they did things great. And all of a sudden you saw them in a lot of dorm rooms. And then followed by MacBook, the iPod and music, and the, the first Apple store. Where was the first Apple store? Help me out. It was in a, Virginia, that's right. Uh, Falls Creek, Virginia. Uh, it was, when was it open, 99? Uh, 2001. 2001. So shortly after you know, Jobs gets there, you know, he's looking at a lot of things. But in terms of Blue Ocean framework, you can see the ultimate Blue Ocean came in things like you know, the iPod. And it was the iPod came first and you put music on it. And you could buy music through an online Apple store, followed by the iPhone. And think about here, it reduced, you know, some of the Me Too cloneness of mobile phones. It raised the standard for what how the phone should operate and the touch screen and what should be there. It eliminated the flip factor and, and inconsistent keyboard layout. And it created the app store and a new category of products. Now they call them apps on PCs. So you can see the product visionary that was Steve Jobs didn't just come back and get Apple on track. He was a blue ocean thinker from the beginning. And what's interesting about that is when you put blue ocean together along with another classic book, Competitive Advantage by Michael Porter. This is an old copy of this book that I dearly love that um, I got from my dad, who passed away way back in 96. But that book is the Bible on competitive strategy. And when you put those two things together and you think about your startup, or you think about maybe a company that you're at right now that needs entrepreneurial thinking, it's never too late to get that strategy thinking back in place. A lot of you have sent comments to some of these BizDoc uh, case studies, and you've said, you give us history, but also tell us how. You know, give us some explanation how. I hope these two books and the four actions framework of Blue Ocean tells you how to challenge and to refine your own thinking about what you're going to do with your startup idea. Or your friend says, will you come join me at my company? And you get to join a mid-stage. And I love mid-stage companies because there's opportunity to bring change to them, but there also is opportunity to still experience growth. You know, you would not... Uh, probably find me um, dragged into a legacy company that been there 30 years. I'd probably be, well, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be on the roof with a rifle. That's too violent. But that metaphor used to be used. It'd be like, you know, I'm going to throw a chair through a window and jump through the hole. You know, I wouldn't be able to take like a, you know, a steady, eddy, long-term corporate position. But that's me. And if that's you, it's never too late. Look what happened at Apple. It's never too late to think about the abilities that your company has 
core competencies, the beachheads that your company has, and to come back and look at life a little different. And when you look at all the things, it wasn't one thing that S Steve Jobs did, it was a way of thinking and it recovered Apple to the point that you may recall, the day the iPhone was released, Steve Jobs filed papers that changed the name of Apple Computer to Apple, just Apple. It was a brand about great experiences and products that made life easier. Think about that. That's all it was. It wasn't Apple computer anymore. Everything was a computer. It was a brand that represented beautiful electronic digital products that made our life easier and added productivity to us. So it could be a phone, it could be a music device, it could be the MacBook Air or your, your iPad, all of that. But he was all about Blue Ocean, but he was doing that before the book was even written. You and me have the opportunity to read that book today and we have the opportunity to dive back into it and to see how all this shook out. So as we back up through it, number one, you know, it's never too late to get strategy right. And number two, when you find a product visionary, the key thing is to find someone to be the whisperer so you can keep them focused. So that they're not out like this being distracted by every idea, but they take their genius into focus. So don't be afraid of product visionaries in your company, embrace them, but you got to find a way to help them focus, not to stuff them into a gray corporate cube um, and into some sort of process orientation that absolutely smothers their creativity, but to take them and to find a way to manage them. Be unafraid of bringing those people in, but be sure that you've got, whether it's you or somebody else, the whisperer that can work with them. You know, Steve Jobs wasn't going to be managed by a corporate guy from Pepsi. But also, even Steve said that during this time period where he mentored with people like Ross Perot, he learned a lot and he was a different man when he came back. But I don't think Steve had to leave. Even with all the stuff that you read about him, I think there could have been, you know, a, an opportunity but Apple wouldn't be Apple if he didn't go off and make next computer and he didn't go off and do some of the things he did. What it is today can never be undone and replicated. That's the 12 years of searching for strategy at Apple. Go pick up a copy of Blue Ocean Strategy and Michael Porter's Competitive Advantage and keep them on your shelf and test your idea and your business plan against them because a red ocean sucks and a blue ocean can take you to amazing new heights where even you look back and are just so impressed by what you and your company has been able to pull off. Okay, I need the pillow. All right, until next time, please subscribe to Value Team, the best channel on the internet for entrepreneurial content and how-tos and encouragement from Patrick Bet David. Until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth and I hope I left you better than I found you.